We're going to get back on track this morning as we go back to the book of Acts. And we will pick up in chapter 15 where we have left off. So if you have your Bible, please turn over to Acts chapter 15. It's a very important chapter. And um, oops, too many remotes up here. There we go. We're not going to go through all these verses today, but I want to just uh, to do a quick recap. Let's go ahead. Um, let's read, picking up at verse 1, we're going to read down to verse 21, just to give us, uh, to familiarize ourselves, to remind ourselves of this text and what's going on here at the Jerusalem Council and, and why the council is taking place. And so Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 1, it says, But some men came down from Judea, and we're teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them, uh, through them among the Gentiles. Excuse me. Verse 13, after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to make from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses had has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Let's pray. Father, as we pick up here in the book of Acts, as we continue in our study, I pray, Father, that you would use this time to teach us. Holy Spirit, teach us from your word this morning. Guide my lips as I speak and let it be your words and let you be glorified in all that is said and done this morning. But Lord, beyond what I say, please work in the hearts of each one of us to hear your word, Lord, the words of God from your scripture, from your word, not the words of men, not the opinions of men, but the truth from your word so that we may glean, we may grow, we may have a deeper understanding and appreciation and love for your word. And Lord, even now as we spend time, Lord, let it let it stir us up. Stir us up to, to want to dig deeper in your word, to want to go deeper with you 
walk closer in our in our day to day in our relationship with you in those quiet hours and those quiet moments that are between you and us alone so that we may bring you glory may live out a life pleasing to you for your glory and so i just ask god that you work in our hearts and even on those in this recording lord for whoever may hear that they would hear the gospel clearly that they could be encouraged where they are um, however you would work, Father, I just pray that you're, you would have control and you would work through this in your Holy Spirit, that he would do the teaching. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 And so we're going to review a little bit starting at verse 6. And so if you remember, what is the main issue in this text? Right, It's salvation. Is it by works of the law or by faith in Jesus Christ? That's been the big focal point of chapter 15. And if you recall, this, this skirmish or area of battle has come up in the past uh, between the Jews and the Gentiles. Chapter 6, we saw a little bit of it. And then more pointedly in chapter 11, and here again it comes up and will be fought to a finish. Now, I don't say a finish as in the problem goes away or doesn't persist. We still deal with this very problem today. People adding um, man's ways to be reconciled to God. And there is no man's way to be reconciled to God. There's only God's way. Yes, men proclaim it, but it's God's way. It's God's word. It's God's truth. And it is not by accident or mistake that God has left these details in his word so that we may learn from them because there are many antichrists, there are many deceivers, there are many heretics that will go and preach another gospel. And we we see this is dealt with so much. As in, I pointed out, I think a while ago, how 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament deal with false teachers. And this is one of the exact reasons why. Because men will come up with their own systems, checks and balances, ways. And there is no way by man. There's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, right? There's no reconciliation of the Father apart from him. And so chapter 11, uh, chapter 11 should have put this issue to rest. In some ways it did, but not, not entirely. But see, the question seems to fall back on what are the conditions. And so it wasn't so much, okay, can the Gentiles be saved? Okay, they can be saved. But now what are the conditions? In other words, it's no longer a question if Gentiles can be saved. That was settled. The question in the... And the reason this battle or skirmish is still on the table is the conditions. What are the conditions for the Gentiles to be saved? And to be frank, yes, we know these false teachers come up, you know, with, with really no authority from the church, but they come from Jew, from Jerusalem and Judea. So there's some, they're, they're, they're probably introducing themselves as having some kind of authority or message. And they're coming up and saying, you must be circumcised according to the custom of Moses, otherwise you can't be saved. And that is not what Jesus taught, and that's not what the gospel that's been going forth has been. And yet, even James and Peter seem to have, and many of the Christians in Jerusalem still have some challenges with this because they're, they're look, they've been raised in a, they're Jewish, Orthodox, Jewish, religious people who are raised that way. And yes, they do believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, for their salvation, but there's still things they don't completely clear on. And they're thinking more along the lines of you, these Gentiles have to become proselytes and then they can get saved or they can become Christians. But God is showing, oh, that's not the, that's not the way. And that's what he, chapter 10 with Cornelius and Peter and all of those, um, all of that account is dealing with. And so, you know, it is being, and so, excuse me. And so what are the questions and the, and the reasons and the battle of this is over the conditions, right? It is, is it being physically circumcised according to the custom of Moses? Or is it ordering them to keep the law of Moses? These are questions, right? Or is it a full-on conversion, first to Judaism, then to, um, and then the Gentile can be saved? I mean, these are the questions. And so what are the conditions? Now, we, if you spend any time with us on this, we're already very clear on what it is. Paul has been debating and going through it, but we're going to go through some more of this as they have this official council. And look, the council is important, again, because it records for us in black and white um, that they gathered together to discuss this issue because it was a serious issue. And 
and they wanted to put it down plainly. And to God be the glory, we have it plainly written down for us today, so we may know that it is no other elements to be added, no other um, works that have to be added. It's the grace of God. By his grace, through faith in Christ alone, plus nothing. And so the council gathers together to consider this matter. This matter is no small thing. As a result, there are much debate or questioning. And so Luke doesn't record what some of this debate or questioning would have sounded like, but he does record info from four speakers that day. And there was more than four people speaking because it says there's, Again, back in, in chapter six, or excuse me, chapter verse six, it says the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, um, discussion, or questioning. And so again, we don't have the details of all that was said and done, we, but we do have the meat. All four of the speakers agree and conclude the same thing. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. They do this by presenting six proofs. And so we have four speakers and six proofs in between verses 6 and verse um, 21. And we're not going to get to all of them today, but um, the four speakers to begin with, we see Peter first speaks. Now, he doesn't first speak as in he just comes in and controls the meeting. There's much debating, there's much questioning, there's back and forth, just like any kind of counsel. He's listening, he's being patient, he's being quick to listen, slow to speak, but at the right time, the Holy Spirit moves and he, and he rises up to speak. So we have Peter, and then it says Barnabas and Paul, and then James, finally. And James is kind of, I shouldn't say kind of, James is the leader, he's the pastor of the Jerusalem church, he's the half-brother of Jesus, and he's the, he's the leader there in Jerusalem. And so the six proofs, we have a past revelation. Number two, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Number three, cleansing from sin. Number four, the inability of the law to save. Uh, number five, facts of miracles. And six, prophetic promises. Now, again, we're not going to get through all these this morning, but let's begin with Peter. And so if you look with me again down at verse, starting at verse seven now, it says, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck? of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And so Peter went, um, well, I should say proof number one, past revelation. And so Peter went to the Gentiles. He, went, he recalled this uh, moment, this account in the past of him going to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, and then in chapter 11, he details with the, with what the critics back in Jerusalem regarding this visit to the Gentiles, right? They, there was some criticism from the leaders in Jerusalem about him going there and eating with them. And this past revelation that he begins with is a well-known, or, or it is well-known at this point. It's a well-established fact. They do know that Cornelius and his household received the gospel and as a result, there was there was six witnesses with Peter that day, and, he, and they could testify to the fact that they received the Holy Spirit just like they did at Pentecost. In the same way, the same outward signs that the Lord provided at that time as they spoke in tongues and extolled God. And so this took place something like 10 years before. So some time has passed since those events with Cornelius and his household back in chapter 10. Um, so about 10 years has passed since then until now. And so... Peter first presents past revelation. As noted a few weeks ago, I mentioned that Peter doesn't use his unique past with Christ or position to throw his weight around. Right? He doesn't say, do you know who I am? I'm Peter. Jesus gave me the, king, the keys to the kingdom, as in Matthew 16, 19. He doesn't do that. He doesn't use any of that. I was one of the disciples. I was one of the first ones called by him. I was, you know... 
all this stuff. He doesn't use that. Most of them are aware of much of this anyways. They understand his position in his place. But he simply meets them and pre presents evidence of what God has been doing. Back in Acts chapter 11, you don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. Starting at verse 15, Peter says, as I be, and this is when he got, um, he's retelling the account to the critics in Jerusalem. He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, referring to Cornelius and his household, the Gentiles, fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. And he said, and he's referring back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus gives us the key verse of the book of Acts. John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, this is the critics, when they heard this, these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. And so this is why I said earlier that this should have been set, uh, this should have been finalized and completed by now. But yet here it is, it's coming up again. Because now the questions are more along the lines of what are the conditions? Peter presented past revelation. The Gentiles were saved by grace. So proof number one is salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Proof number two, gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse eight, Peter says, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Only God sees and knows the heart. Because God sees the heart, he alone truly knows who is saved. And therefore, when the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues and extolling God, it was because they were truly saved. See, God doesn't make errors or mistakes. God didn't prematurely give the Holy Spirit to these Gentiles if there were still things they needed to do to be saved. Back in chapter 10, we never get told that God instructed Peter to go there, give him the gospel, then also let him know they needed to be circumcised or they needed to you know, do other things. Um, he, he didn't. They, they, they were told that they were going to hear what they needed to do to be saved. Peter comes, gives the gospel. They rejoice. They receive it. And as Peter is still preaching, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And so God doesn't make errors. These Gentiles in Caesarea that day were saved, and Peter mentions that. But he also mentions the gift of the Holy Spirit that they saw at Pentecost, the sign that Jesus said he would send the Comforter. Romans 8, 27 says, and he who searches hearts, that's God, he searches hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So God doesn't make errors. He knows the heart. He knows the mind. He knows the thoughts. He knows those who, who are his. 1 Samuel 16, 7, verse 7 says, for the Lord sees not as man sees, Right? Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so, yes, God, Jesus does says you'll know them by their fruits. And we are to live out our faith and we should be known um, who we're connected to, that we are followers of Christ, the way we live, the way we conduct our lives. But people can fake that. People have faked that. People in big ministries have faked that. But God's not mocked and that stuff does come out. But God, thankfully knows the hearts he knows. Jeremiah 16, verse 9 and 10 comes to mind too. Remember, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And the Lord says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I, Jehovah, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And so when they believed the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, he gave them the Holy Spirit and sealed them because they believed Jesus knows the heart. God knows the hearts of these Gentiles. Now, I don't know your heart and you don't know mine. In fact, we don't even know our own hearts, but God does. And part of what 
is very, very revealing about that is just the verse there in, in um, Jeremiah that we just looked at here in 16 <clears throat> verses 9 and 10 about the heart. But if you think in the gospel of Matthew where Jesus is going about and there's these two little accounts and um, the scribe says, you know, I'm going to come and follow you. So they're getting in the boat, getting ready to cross over the sea. And um, Jesus replies and says, you know, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So a scribe was a very high position person. He was a teacher. He was a high standing in academics and, and, and society. And the point Jesus was making is like, the Son of Man, that's Jesus. He didn't even have a home. And, and so what is understood very clearly is that, look, you're going to have to give up these things, this life, this comfort, um, if, you're, if you want to follow me. And, and does that mean that the, the scribe was, was not serious? Well, I think he was serious. But when he counted the cost, he decided not to follow him because there's nothing else that says, there's nothing else in that account that says anything about the scribe coming and following him. He just, it's just silence. And then there's another man that says, well, I'm going to follow you too. Just let me go bury my father first. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Now, when you read these and you don't have any context or understanding of, of the saying, it might seem a little harsh or a little cold. But you have to understand that is a saying that even today in the Middle East is, is understood to mean, it doesn't mean his father is dead. It means that I have to fulfill my responsibilities at home in order to get my inheritance. And so in other words, when I finish that up and I get my money, or I get my inheritance, then I'll come and follow you. Folks, we can relate to that because there are people today that say, I don't have time for church right now because I got to get, you know, I, I got to build my business right now. I've got to get my house paid off. I got to get my new car. I got to have my vacations paid for. I, I need to, once I get to this level or I get this million dollars in my bank account, then I'll have time to worship God. No. It's not the way it works. I'm sorry. You're choosing to worship money over, over man. And, and that man, I mean, Jesus even talks about that in other places. You know, if you, you honor your, we are to honor our moms and dads, but if you place mother, father, sister, brother, uh, children, anything above him, you're not worthy. God doesn't say to neglect your responsibilities to his father or his household or his family, but he chose those things over Christ. Because, again, it doesn't say anything else. It just goes silent. Um, and so the, the fact what I'm saying is I'm grateful that we have this about our hearts because we can't trust our own hearts. We trust the word of God. We trust what Christ has done. That is what your foundation should be on is Christ the rock, not in this is how I feel, this is what I believe in my heart. Don't believe the lie, right? Today we hear, believe in yourself or just follow your heart. We have a generation of people now, and really even further back, where every song, nursery rhyme, book, cartoon, movie, all has this theme, follow your heart, believe in yourself. And what does Scripture say? Complete, almost complete opposite. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust your heart. And yet, it's almost no wonder it's so hard for people um, to see this. And in fact, they may even say, I think that's really cruel or unkind. I just, you know, I just feel it in my heart. I just, I understand. But God has given us feelings. He's given us emotions. But he's given us his word and his truth. And this is why this, this council and what's going on here is so important because I believe some of these Pharisees who are true believers, the ones here at the end where it says, you know, they rose up and said, it said they were believers. The party of the Pharisees rose up and said it is necessary to circumcise them and order them to keep the law of Moses. They, they believe that was the right thing in their heart before the Lord, probably. But the point is, is whether they believe that to be the right thing or not, that's not what God said. That's not what his plan of salvation was. It wasn't for everyone to be funneled through Judaism to be saved. He was going to meet Jews and Gentiles and save them the exact same way through his shed blood on the cross. He is the Redeemer. Because otherwise, again, you have to erase a lot of scriptures because then you have to put some 
put some of the burden on your own shoulders saying like, well, I did this much of it and God did the rest. No, God did it all. And so proof number two, the gift of the Holy Spirit is only given to those who truly belong to God. And God knows the hearts. He knows men. He knows who are his. Proof number three, cleansing from sin. Verse nine, Peter says, and he made no distinction no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Not by works, not by efforts, not by following some traditions or some rules or partaking in a physical activity. He cleansed their hearts by faith. No difference um, or distinction or no difference. It's the Greek word, um, diek. Renan, um, to judge that there is a difference or a distinction, to make a distinction, to judge that there is, is a difference. And so it's in the negative, so that it's to judge that there is no difference. There's no difference. He made no distinction or difference between us and them, being the Jews and the Gentiles, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Romans 2.11, for God shows no partiality. Peter says the same thing while dealing with the very topic of the Gentiles being saved back in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, where he, where he first comes to the house of Cornelius and um, they, Cornelius reveals like why he called for him to come. And obviously Peter knows that God's already given him several visions and understanding to go with the men there. And Peter says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. He's referring to the fact that he's a Jew and Cornelius is a Gentile. Both Jews and Gentiles need cleansing from their sins. This is done by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works of the law, but by faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we know it well, but for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God and not a result of works so that no one may boast. Not of works. We serve a God, excuse me, we serve a good, holy, and wise God. And he's good. And the writer of Proverbs 24, verse 23 says, partiality in judging is not good. God doesn't do something that's not good. He's not going to show partiality in his judgment. And one more, De Deuteronomy 10, 17, it says, For the Lord, your God, is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great the mighty and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. What did Jesus refer to the Pharisees? They were whitewashed sepulchers. They looked pretty on the outside, but they were full of dead man's bones. God isn't fooled by this. So proof number three, cleansing from sin proves salvation is by God's grace. If you are a religious person today, please listen. There is no advantage or head start for you because you go to church or because you hold on to all the church traditions or you spent more time than anyone before, you know, in fasting and prayer and, and maybe in the uh, confession booth or anything else. It does not you don't get to say, well, you know, maybe I'm not there yet, but I have at least this advantage. No, before God, you don't. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It's his unmerited favor. It's his grace. The Gentiles who were saved were already cleansed of their sins. There is no delay. There is no additional process. One writer said those purified of their sins are obviously saved and God does not cleanse people who are not truly saved. Such cleansing comes only by God's grace. The Gentile believers are cleansed of their sins by God's wonderful matchless grace. What more could the law of Moses and rituals add? Nothing. The work of God's law did its work. It shows us all how sinful we are. That's what the law did. And yes, how hopeless we are without God's marvelous 
Christ. You know, 1910, that was the year my great-grandfather was born, um, Asher Allen. And I had the privilege of knowing him quite well. But in, in that same year, in 1910, Julia H. Johnston wrote a wonderful hymn on God's grace. She writes, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold, threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see his face. Will you this moment his grace receive? Maybe by now you know what the song is. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. God's unmerited favor. It is by God's grace. This is why he gets all the glory. Can you imagine if we add anything to this? It's such, it's such an insult to our Heavenly Father. Now, he's merciful, and he knows that when we're young in our faith, we stumble around, and we, we misunderstand things, and we're learning. So we don't have all this stuff perfectly. And then Christians that just get saved, they don't, have, they don't know the doctrine of justification or, or of, of God's grace. They don't know all these terminologies, but the way they're saved is simply the fact that they put their faith on Christ. They didn't have to get all cleaned up because you can't. You, you really can't. Yes, you're turning from your sin. You're turning to Christ. You're, you're going to him in repentance, about face from the direction you're going. But it is God's grace, God's grace that he freely offers to all who will believe. Will you believe that to stay? And number four, this is the last one we'll look at this morning, in the inability of the law to save. Verses 10 and 11, now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test, Peter says, by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Do not test God. Peter warns the Judaizers very seriously not to put God to the test he warns them not to place that heavy, chafing burden of a yoke on the shoulders of the Gentiles when, they, when the Jews know full well they were never able to keep it. That's Peter's point. He says, neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. And so why would the Gentiles be able to bear it? I imagine everyone here knows what a yoke is, but if you've never seen one, they're, they're a large um, generally, I mean, old fashioned, they're all carved from wood. And they were, though they could be put on the shoulders of men to carry things, often you would think of them on a pair of oxen or something that, that carry heavy burdens. And that's the point. It's to carry a heavy burden of the law. And the law can't even be held up by man, it can't be obtained. It's, it points us to the fact that we are absolutely bankrupt before a holy God. And so thank the Lord for his grace. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Verse 11, that Peter says, do not test God. <clears throat> Folks, the law of God has never saved a single soul. Not one. Because even if you could, and I, and I believe this is not true, but even if you could boast that you have kept nine out of the ten perfectly, you still broke one. Even if you said, well, I've kept all ten of them, but I've only slipped in one of them one time in my life for a split second. Guess what? It's enough before a holy God because we're born in sin. We're not born innocent. And unfortunately, there are people that teach that. that all children are born really innocent and pure and they become corrupted. No, they're born corrupted. They are. It's not my opinion. That's what the scriptures clearly teach. The law was given to the Jewish nation to protect them from the evils of the Gentile world and prepare them to bring the Messiah into the world. The law cannot purify the sinner's heart. 
right? Galatians 2.21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. The law cannot impart the gift of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 3.2. Let me ask you, Paul says, only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? No. And the law cannot give eternal life. Galatians 3.21, Paul again writes, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. Certainly not, with an exclamation point. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. And we need to close up this morning and prepare for the Lord's table. But before we do that, let us look once more at verses 10 and 11. Let me just read them once more. Peter says, as he's concluding his speech, he says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Listen to this. But we believe, Peter says, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Please listen. Did you see what Peter did there? He didn't say we believe that they can be saved by grace through faith just like us. In other words, Peter didn't say they can be like us. He didn't say that. But that would be the expected way Peter would have said that. They can be like us. Peter knows that is the issue. The Gentiles don't have to be like the Jews to be saved. That's the point of why he does this. Peter knows the answer to the question and deliberately turns this around and says, we believe. Speaking to the Jews as a Jew, he says, we believe that they will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as, just as they will. Uh, excuse me, just as we will. And James Boyce asks a question. Regarding this verse, he writes, do you ever think that other people have to become like you to be saved? He continues, if so, you probably are far, or you are, if so, you are probably far from truly understanding the gospel. And again, I don't know that we would ever say it out loud, but sometimes if we examine our hearts, we start to place these burdens on people, even if it's just in our minds that well, we decide maybe sometimes that someone's not, we don't really think they're saved because of whatever. But you also never really looked at yourself when you first got saved and saw all your, all your goof ups and, and your stumbling around as you were just learning to walk and just learning to drink the milk. In fact, Sometimes if we could step out of ourselves even now, you know, you've been a believer for some time and you were to examine your day, you may go, Oof. if people saw the way I handled this or acted or the way I thought about this, uh, they would have been pretty shocked. I'm shocked. We're not perfect. God didn't take it all away. Um, that's why we are being sanctified and God has redeemed us. He has declared us righteous before he has dealt with all of our sin, past, present, and future. But he, he didn't, and he could have. I know he could have, but he didn't. His plan was not that he would just perfect us now. But he said, for those that are his, he's going to complete that work. But let's be careful. We don't then thrust it on new believers. And maybe they're not believers yet, but maybe they're earnestly seeking. And sometimes we're too quick to write someone off. We're too quick to to just be like, yeah, they're not serious. Please don't forget this either. If someone is, maybe comes to the church or maybe someone comes into your life and they're asking you questions and they don't seem like, man, they're just, they're thick. They're not getting it. I don't think they're serious. They just keep like, whatever I say, they do the opposite. <laughs> there is spiritual warfare going on. We, we need to always remember that. And someone who may not look like it maybe to us, who is seriously seeking the Lord, I'll tell you, the flesh and the enemy are going to fight tooth and nail to keep them distracted. Again, we don't see this 
we don't see always necessarily the outward stuff and dramatic stuff so much in the West because we're so distracted by everything else. But in um, my sister had a couple friends, they lived in Brazil and their family were missionaries in, in parts of the jungle there. And when people in certain tribes that they were ministering to, a young boy or somebody who was getting close, they were hearing the gospel and, and they, they, there was an interest, there was, God was calling them. They were convicted of sin. They were starting to see who this Jesus was. They said without a doubt, they would see all kinds of awful opposition. I mean, stuff, demonic stuff, things that would, you don't hear about here so much because if Satan can do anything, he's going to do everything he can to prevent people coming to Christ. And then those who come to Christ, he wants to prevent us from living for Christ. Don't forget, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There is a spiritual warfare. Just because we don't see it with our eyes doesn't mean it's not there. We don't know the battle certain people who are seeking or going through. Certain people that come pass through our church sometimes, we wonder, you know, they just completely fade away. We don't have any way of contacting them or they don't, or if we do, it doesn't work anymore. We don't know. And it's not always because they necessarily just left, but it, but it certainly there is an element of spiritual warfare. And so be prayerful for them and be careful with our expectations. This is a warning to myself as much as anyone else. That if we start to think that people have to be just like us and we create our little clique and our little culture here, is it biblical? Is it godly? Or is it because it's convenient? It's because what's what we like? Or is it, or are we truly ministering to the word of God to those who are in need of it? I'll finish with this. Another writer comments about this. He says, the statement we are saved just as they are is amazing. A Jew under the law would say the opposite and in reverse order they are saved as we are but one who knew god's grace as peter did would not say that salvation for anyone jew or gentile is by god's grace and it is by faith and so don't miss those little things in the scriptures where peter reverses the order there to make a point he's speaking to religious jewish people that are believers but they're struggling in this area and they're reminded, yes, they are saved just like we are. It's a humbling time. Now, there's a couple more things we're going to look at next. Starting next week, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up with the rest of the proofs with Paul and Barnabas and then with James' conclusion and his, his final judgments there. Um, but what about you this morning? You know, are you trying to earn your salvation? Have you, are you trying to do things to be, a, um, to be a good Christian or a good person, quote, unquote, or do you know that it's through Christ alone that you are saved? It's all Jesus. Jesus, as the song says, paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. So if you don't know Jesus this morning, would you please contact us? Would you please reach out to us this morning? Um, I'd love to speak with you. I'd love to show you from the word on how you can know who he is, how you can know how to be saved and what the word says about it. Look, he says all, all are sinners, you know, all fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And so we need a savior. And he paid it all on the cross. He made a way so that we can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Believe what he said, don't call him a liar. Trust in what he said and not in yourself, 